Are you interested in the Nintendo Switch but don't know where to start? Are you considering getting one for yourself or maybe someone else? Maybe you just got one and want to see what games you can get? Or are you wondering what sort of accessories are out there and if there's anything specific about the system you should be aware of before buying? Well, whatever scenario you might find yourself in, this is the video for you. We'll take a look at the available hardware, games and accessories. And while I can't talk about every specific aspect of the system, or every game for that matter, we're still going to take a look at things from all sorts of different perspectives to cover as much ground as possible. Let's start with the hardware. There's two choices you've got here. The first one is the regular Nintendo Switch with the removable Joy-Con controller. The second option is the more recently released Switch Lite, which is a more portable version of the system. It's smaller in size and features, but also in price. The regular Switch has a 6.2 inch screen, it comes with a dock and Joy-Con controllers. You can go from TV mode to handheld on the fly, as well as tabletop mode if you want. There's a stand, which is admittedly flimsy, that holds the console up and the Joy-Con just slide out. It has a battery life of 5.5 to 9 hours depending on the game and screen brightness. The Switch Lite is smaller, with the screen coming in at 5.5 inches. It has 3 to 7 hours of battery life. It's missing a few features, like there's no rumble, and the controllers are integrated and non-removable, and the infrared camera found on the right Joy-Con is absent. TV output is non-existent, so there's no way to get the image onto a bigger screen. You can pair a set of Joy-Con if you want to regain rumble, IR, and some other functions. Of course, the Pro Controller works too. Just be aware that with Joy-Con, you do need some sort of way to recharge them because, well, obviously the system won't physically accept them. The advantages of the Lite is that it's smaller and it has a cheaper price. A regular one comes in at $400, while the Switch is just $260 Canadian. If you live in the US, that translates to $300 and $200 respectively. Joy-Con are around $80 US apparently, so is it really worth going with the Lite? I don't think so, but hey, not everyone's me, and there are people who could really take advantage of the smaller dimensions. Also, if you're wondering, the light does retain the motion controls, so you can still aim when shooting arrows and Zelda and things like that. If you're going for a used Switch, there's a third hardware option too. The regular Switch had a refresh, which effectively gives the console better battery life. The original models, like mine, have 2.5 to 6.5 hours of battery life rather than 4.5 to 9. That's quite a bit less. You can tell which is which by the box. This is the old Switch, this is the new one. If there's no box, check the serial number on the bottom of the unit. If it starts with XKW, then it's a new one. Anything below that, like XAW, then you know it's an original. Since I barely use my Switch in handheld mode, it doesn't really make a difference to me, but if you do, then I highly recommend the newer model. There are some games that don't work with the Switch Lite out of the box, and I think that's probably worth mentioning. Just to avoid surprises, you'll have to get separate Joy-Con for them. They are 1-2 Switch, just Dance, Super Mario Party, Fitness Boxing, Ring Fit Adventure, and Nintendo Labo. Labo is made with the original Switch in mind, so the cardboard contraptions that are made to hold the system in some way won't work with the light, so keep that in mind. Now let's look at games. This is an interesting topic, since there's a lot of different ways we could approach it. Of course, there's the Nintendo perspective, which is obvious. Mario and Zelda games are always a good place to start. Super Mario Odyssey and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild are considered some of the best entries of their respective series. Super Mario Odyssey is very open and accessible. It's got that pick up and play and put down and go away thing going for it. You can play it in short bursts, or you can spend more time and try to get all the power moons or other hidden things. Some people prefer other Mario games, as do I actually. I still think Super Mario 3D World on the Wii U is overall better. But Odyssey offers a unique experience that also includes some Mario 64 vibes. Breath of the Wild is the first true open-world 3D Zelda game. It combines elements found in early 2D Zelda games and puts them into a 3D context. So both Mario and Zelda have become more non-linear and open than recent previous titles. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is great fun. This is one of those games that people play online a lot, so it's probably a good time to mention that online on the Switch isn't free for most games. It's $25 Canadian a year, but we'll get into that a bit later. Another good online game is Splatoon 2. It's a third-person shooter. Instead of shooting bullets, you shoot ink at opponents, and in multiplayer, you also try to cover as much of your playing field in your color. The one who has the most coverage when splatting wins. 
It's also the only game in the world where the player base will make fun of you for not using motion controls. Again, a Switch Online subscription is required. There's a single player mode too, and the DLC available for it is quite different from the regular single player mode. I guess you could call it more challenge based. And the story behind it is pretty interesting too, especially if you've played the first game, so give that a shot. There's Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe for 2D Mario action, Luigi's Mansion 3, because why wouldn't you mention it? The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening is a remake of the excellent original Game Boy game of the same name. If you want something that scratches the classic Zelda itch, then here you go. Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu for Gen 1 vibes. Pokemon Sword and Shield are the newest mainline games in the series. People are really vocal about it not having a complete Pokedex, yet it's the Switch's fastest selling title. And Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and its expansion have you covered in terms of RPGs. There, that covers a lot of first and second party games. But there's also a good amount of multi-platform games that made their way onto the Switch. As you can imagine, they usually don't run the best on the Switch, but if portability is what you want, then the Switch ports are for you. Whether a port is good or not really depends. It seems to be a case-by-case -case basis. The Switch is also a great place for people wanting to replay last-gen games, since a lot of them have been ported. So if you missed or never got around to some of them back in the day, you might find them on the Switch. On another but somewhat similar note, a lot of Japanese games are finding themselves on the Switch these days. Specifically games with an anime art style. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, Vita games aren't really being released anymore, at least for the most part, and the Vita was a really great place for anime style niche games. So both developers and gamers started transitioning to the Switch because of the handheld nature of those systems. Plus, there's been a move from PS4 to Switch as well. And the main reason for that is because of Sony shenanigans. Neptunia, Sanran Kagura, Disgaea, Morero Chronicle, the Atelier series, Valkyria Chronicles, and a whole bunch more can be found on the Switch now. Though, because of the lack of horsepower, some franchises haven't ported their mainline games over. These developers often operate on smaller budgets, so while CD Projekt Red might have been able to squeeze The Witcher 3 onto the Switch, Idea Factory and Compile Heart are probably not going to be able to port Neptunia V2R properly. I mean, even Disgaea 5 had to run at a lower resolution, and that game uses 2D sprites for its characters and relatively simple 3D environments. After talking about all those games, it's time to start addressing some accessories. While it's not required, I would highly recommend getting a micro SD card for the Switch. The Switch isn't my main console, and I always buy physical games except if they're digital only. Yet my 128GB card is about one-fourth full. That's because of patches, DLC, and of course games. If this is going to be your or the recipient's main console, then definitely look into it. It's a bit of a pain to re-download everything down the line because you can't just copy or transfer the data, so might as well get one right away if you can. 128GB is the minimum I would recommend. I just bought a micro SD card at $25 Canadian. So I don't think there is much of a reason to go with 64 or less. You may want to get a stand too. There's tons available and it saves you having to rely on that terribly unstable thing that's built into the system. Lights don't have a stand, by the way, so that's something to consider too. I'm not a fan of how Joy-Con controllers feel, so I like the idea of having a Pro Controller. Ever since I got one, the Joy-Con haven't been getting much use at all. Out of all current gen systems, I like the Switch Pro Controller the most in terms of how the thing feels in my hand. But the D-pad is strange. It feels a bit hard to push on, yet it feels indirect too. For example, if you press up or down, it's easy to accidentally go left and right as well if you rock your thumb even a little bit. Not ideal for 2D games in my opinion, but I guess it's better than the D-pad on the GameCube controller. Also, an interesting thing to note is that HD rumble, or haptic feedback as it's also known, feel stronger with the Joy-Con compared to the Pro Controller. That's not a bad thing necessarily, but it's something to note. At least it has it, unlike other alternatives you can get. Not that you shouldn't go with other controller options. There are other manufacturers that make full-size controllers, which I don't have experience with. Perhaps it's best finding some dedicated reviews on those specifically. Same thing with Joy-Con alternatives. They all seem to omit one or more features, but can be of benefit in other ways, like a bigger grip or a D-pad. Another thing you might want to do is get a case for your Switch. You know how the Wii had so much shovelware? Well, imagine that concept with the Switch, except with cases. 
There's so many cases, it's hard to figure out which one to get. If you don't have any specific wants, then the choice is pretty easy. Go to Best Buy, get their house brand Insignia case, or something Nintendo licensed, and it'll be fine. I've used the Insignia case for mine, and it's okay. Until I ran out of space for games. TomTalk has a popular line of Switch cases that you might want to consider. TomTalk actually sent me two to take a look at for another video. I like them and use them now, especially the big ones since it houses a bunch of games and other accessories. It does look a bit like a whale though. Since I don't own a Switch Lite, I can't really tell you much about specific cases for it, but I can't see how things could be that much different from a regular Switch. I'm sure the selection is similar. Just like phone cases, there's no shortage of information on the internet on that. The Nintendo Switch does have some issues you should be aware of. In the beginning, there were all sorts of strange things that apparently happened and people experienced, but I don't hear about that anymore. Like systems bending inwards? A friend of mine has a launch day Switch that is slightly curved. It seems to stop at some point, so I'm not really worried about it folding in on itself or anything. If I put a ruler across mine, it definitely is slightly curved too, but it doesn't seem to be an issue. Something called Joy-Con drift might be a thing you've heard about. That's when the analog stick derps to one side, not physically, but in-game. Basically, it's like the N64 analog stick where it doesn't register on center. Nintendo put out a video on how to fix it with rubbing alcohol. The Pro Controller also has a similar issue, which is caused by the plastic on the housing being ground up into dust by the analog stick stem, and then getting underneath and ruining the mechanism. You can take some precaution by cutting some electrical tape to size and putting it on the stem part. Something that you may be interested in is Nintendo Switch Online. I already mentioned it before. Most online games require a subscription in order to access online functions like multiplayer. It's 20 US a year or 35 a year for a family plan, which allows up to eight accounts to make use of online functions. Subscribing to online gives you access to NES and SNES games to play, which is pretty cool. A lot of the most popular games for the systems are included. And there's games that get added from time to time. If you're used to how voice chat is on the PS4 and Xbox 3, don't expect those kinds of features on the Switch. Voice chat is basically not a thing here. Yes, there's a Nintendo Switch online app that allows voice chat with Splatoon 2, but it's not anything I've ever heard people praise. If you're playing with friends, use Discord, I guess. Switch Online includes cloud save game storage for games that support it, which you may want since the system doesn't allow you to make backups of save games in any other way. That's good, I guess, until about a decade from now, or whenever Nintendo decides to can the service. There's some points or subjects that I haven't brought up yet, and I'm now going to just mention in this miscellaneous section. The resolution of the Switch, that's both models, is 1280 by 720 so 720p. When it's docked, it can be anything up to 1080p. Many games adjust resolution on the fly, i.e. lower it, to keep performance consistent. Breath of the Wild doesn't do that, but it caps the resolution to 90, or sorry, 900p rather. So there's a bunch of different techniques to keep games running consistently. Many multi-platform games run at 30 rather than 60 frames per second on the Switch, though there are some games, usually exclusives like Splatoon 2 and also Mario Odyssey, which run at 60. The resolution of the textures are usually lower and you'll find some strange artifacts on effects, like shadows or blur. Usually it'll be a bit blocky, Games usually run better in handheld mode than when docked because of the lower resolution, but that's not always the case. The Witcher 3 runs better docked, for example. Presumably that's a battery life thing. You can't use Bluetooth headphones on the Switch. It has Bluetooth, but that's for the controllers only. You can use those Bluetooth adapter things that plug into the 3.5mm port, but that seems more cumbersome than just using a proper set of headphones. It's up to you, of course. All Switches have 32 gigabytes of built-in storage. If you use a micro SD card, save games will still be saved to the system no matter what, hence why you can't back up save data. Multimedia support is limited, there's only YouTube, and if you live in the US you also get Hulu, whatever that is. Since we're a couple of years in, I'm finding it more and more unlikely that we're going to see something like Netflix or Amazon. At least it has YouTube, so that's kind of convenient. It works well and looks like every YouTube app on any other console or smart TV. I didn't talk about Nintendo Labo in this video since it's quite a specific thing. I don't own Labo things. I see it being mocked on the internet quite a bit since it's cardboard. But I say if it looks fun, 
don't worry about it and just enjoy it. There's a lot of videos about the subject, including from Nintendo itself, if you want to know more. Overall, I think that's a decent amount of information on the Nintendo Switch if you're new to the subject. Let's face it though, these videos are often watched by people who not only have the system, but know a lot about it. So whatever your situation is, I hope you had fun watching. Let me know in the comments about your suggestions, experiences, and advice. A video such as this can't really cover everything, so nuggets of info in the comments are always welcome. If you like the video and like what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon, like all of these people are here. There's a few benefits that you can get, like seeing videos before they come out, as well as behind the scenes updates and videos. There's a merch store too, which also supports the channel. Check the links in the description to that and other things like Twitter and so on. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next video.